Uh, before I start, there's been a number of uh, discussions about Flexi this morning. If anyone would like a copy of my uh, presentation from last year talking about the performance of Flexi, I'd be delighted to send it to you. My email address will be at the end of this. However, today, uh, what I'm talking about is some use cases for um, use cases for EVPN over SR to handle some proprietary issues we've come up with, sorry, we've encountered in the mobile world that we thought would be useful to share. So we'll start off with the first one. Uh, that's about inter-DU coordination. This was a scenario we were asked to deal with. Starting off, very straightforward, backhaul to a CU, to another cell site, mid-hall to a DU, to a radio, to a UE. Very simple, no problems. Then we come in with a second antenna. That's where things start to get fun because then the potential for the need for coordination comes in. Carrier aggregation, and particularly if the other antenna is uh, somewhere else, uh, coordinated multipoint or intercell interference coordination. At that point, if you have a different DU, these two DUs now need to be tightly coordinated in order to make those work. Some of the earlier speakers talking about timing were talking about that coordination in that area. However, they need to be coordinated functionally as well. With the particular mobile vendor we were working with, they chose to do that with an inter-DU coordination link. To the best of my knowledge, that doesn't exist in 3GPP. However, that was how they made it work in the practical equipment they actually had. So therefore, that was the transport re requirement we were faced with. So in this first use case, what we'll talk about is that coordination link and splitting that across multiple sites, because that's where it gets very interesting from a transport perspective. Firstly, just to give the technical requirements on that inter-DU link, um, there was a requirement to do 200 microseconds DU to DU, quite tight for transport. Uh, the IP and MAC were auto-generated by the equipment um, in a way that I think it would be fair to say was a tad non-standard. Uh, therefore, Ethernet forwarding was required um, because subnetting didn't really work with this IP generation. Uh, therefore, we had to be looking at L2 EVPN rather than L any form of L3. Moving on, the ports were conveniently 10 giggy, no problem there. Uh, no timing requirement because the timing was already being done via the mid-hall interface, to be clear. It was, it, so there is a requirement, just not via this mechanism. And here's where it gets really interesting. Each DU may need to be connected to up to 32 neighbors. So we are talking quite large clusters at this point. There you go, that's the technical requirements. Moving on. Now let's look at how this would work if you connected it together in a simplified way before I provide my recommended way. This is where we started on the last chart, two DUs with intrasite coordination between two antennas. Now let's add another smartphone going to another cell site, another DU, and therefore need for more coordination. This coordination link is now going between two sites. This is now a transport problem, not a wiring problem. Add a further smartphone, and of course it then cascades down to a third site, and we now have a daisy chain mechanism. This daisy chain mechanism works beautifully except for two distinct problems. Problem number one is this is a linear daisy chain. This is one dimensional. The world, as many of us, some of us even escape from this room will know, is not one dimensional. The world does not just go that way, it goes that way as well, and in many cases up and down. So a linear interconnect with only two ports per DU just does not work for that. You really need some form of transport to do any kind of general purpose use of this functionality. Secondly, uh, having fiber routes between DUs directly is not very easy. Some people are fiber rich, so they can just have a parallel fiber path up and down, but uh, even that is adding complexity that you possibly don't want. So the solution in this audience for MPLS is fairly obvious. Um, we will use EVPN on SR. So we'll add on at the cell site, 
an InterDU L2 eVPN and an L3 eVPN for F1. That's going through the same cell site rotor or router, depending upon your language. That's now aggregating down one fiber, so it's saving fiber. And because it's going back to a central point, it will give you fast switching. As was discussed in previous presentations, timing is always important for these scenarios, so those will be on these devices too. We can now freely add in additional sites, all with the same kind of mechanism. I've missed a step. Uh, the cell site router may, of course, need to be outdoor mount or mount directly on the wall or the uh, mast. Now we've got these multiple cell sites. We can put in a smartphone, a UE, that can talk to multiple sites that are now coordinated. The inter-DU inter coordination works nicely. Now those coordination functions, the carrier aggregation, the coordinated multipoint, the intercell interference coordination should work nicely. So to summarize that, this provides a practical capex problem by sharing fiber for the two applications. Uh, it generalizes the geographic layout. It gets you away from that linear configuration and into an arbitrary two-dimensional, three-dimensional layout of radios. It allows strong traffic segregation between the very latency-sensitive, jitter-sensitive coordination traffic at L2, as well as the slightly less fussy traffic in F1. Provides very low latency in jitter, as you would expect with segment routing. However, as mentioned, Flexi, one of my favorite topics, um, if latency does become a problem, if you really need that extra kilometer or two, then Flexi will uh, cut out about five microseconds per switch, which given that we're talking three switches here, that's effectively maybe giving you an extra three kilometers of reach there. So there's the solution for the first use case. So now we'll move on to the second use case. The second use case is dynamic load balancing of radios via front hall. So this is uh, another, another scenario we were asked to handle um, by a radio vendor. Again, this is proprietary functionality, but it seemed fair to share what is quite common practice. My marketing people tell me firmly to make it clear when I'm changing gear, so my apologies for this chart. I'm talking about front hall now. I hope everybody enjoyed that animation. Now, for the grown-up charts. Um, we are now talking about multiple radios all having front hall aggregation through some kind of front hall switch or front hall gateway going back to a DU server farm. In this configuration, we have many radios coming together, so we may have multiple DU blades. Uh, it has become something of a practice in the industry to terminate front hall directly onto DUs, perhaps directly onto accelerator cards. Um, so what that, of course, means is you pretty much have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a radio and a port on a DU card. This is what this discussion is about. So, uh, because I did far too much maths in my youth, I've assumed we have K blades per cell site. Then when we get a second cell site uh, with more radios, we will need a further K blades. Should we continue on up to N? As you can tell, I spent far too much time in maths lectures as a young person. Uh, we get up to NK blades. Put that in more human terms, if we have 20 cell sites and three blades per cell site, which is fairly common, that's now 60 separate server blades. That is a lot. That's getting to be quite a large server farm. So the significant point we want to talk about is busy periods. The busy period for this cell site will probably not be the busy period for this cell site. So perhaps this one is in a commercial area, so it is mostly busy during the day. Perhaps this one is in a suburban area, so it is mostly busy during the evenings. Perhaps this cell site is down at a sports arena, so it is only busy when there's a sports event on and not at all otherwise. At the moment, this configuration is very inefficient because if this sports arena set of DU blades are idle, they're idle. 
you can't do anything else with them because the wiring physically goes into those DU blades. That is an efficiency problem. So what you're effectively doing is you're dimensioning on the sum of the individual peaks of the cell site loading. That is the problem here. It's also inflexible. Um, whenever you want to add bands or rearrange things, you have to rewire things at the aggregation site. Resilience is tricky if you have a DU failure and your radios are directly wired into the DU, perhaps via DWDM alternatively, um, then the DU's gone, so the radio's dead, so you have an outage. That is not optimal. You can solve that by duplicating the DUs, but then we've gone from 60 blades to 120 blades, which is probably not practical. Finally, we've got a huge compute farm here, so of course what we should be talking about is how we use it for other compute applications when it's idle, and this would be tricky because again, you've got many separate pools, which is inefficient. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this thought, which is what we should do is pre-aggregate the front hall so that we have one pool of blades, one shared pool of blades, rather than a separate pool of blades for each cell site. Therefore, what I've done is I've introduced a router there, which uh, probably in most systems would end up being a leaf spine array. Having done that, usually what we find is we're now cutting in half the number of blades, very approximately. There's not a lot of science behind that number, but that's what people tend to do, and it seems to work so far. The key thing here is what we have is one L2 domain, one layer 2 Ethernet domain that all of the radios are connected to and all of the DUs are connected to. With the vendor we're working with, their DUs had a coordination function. The DUs would automatically be allocated to radios according to load, according to availability, and according to failures. So all of those previous points are now addressed. Let's work through them. Firstly, we talked about latency. You know with front hall, latency is everything. You must have careful engineering. These technologies, however, SR or flexi if things are getting tight, um, can deliver these very low latencies with careful engineering. Our dimensioning has now gone from the, to the peak of the sum of the cell sites. So in other words, if that one's low, but that one's busy, then your sum is lower than the sum of both peaks. So that's giving the 50% savings that we're talking about. That's giving load sharing. That load sharing is dynamic as the load changes from day to night. The gentleman who provided me this microphone, I think was telling me I was very similar to Madonna in having it. Um, so. If you talk about these events things, if you've got Madonna on in the evening performing, this cell site is very busy. All of these other cell sites are probably very quiet because people have moved there. This gives you more pay as you grow. We've dealt with a number of uh, very established mobile operators, but also some new mobile operators. With new mobile operators, obviously capex is always a concern. Pay as you grow is important. You only need the DUs according to the level of usage you have. So if you are rolling out huge numbers of radios for coverage, but you don't yet have that many subscribers, this allows you to start off with a small number of blades and work up later, which is a potential advantage. Resilience, we talked about the previous case where if a DU failed, your radio failed, you have an outage. Now you have a pool. If a DU fails, it doesn't really matter. There's a temporary glitch, the radio is rerouted to another one. Life is simple. Lower OPEX, you don't need to visit the central aggregation site which whenever you add a cell site, whenever you add a band, and for all of us who have worked in this space, which I presume is everybody in the room, radio people cannot stop themselves adding bands on cell sites. It's like a disease. And finally, we now have a pool of DU blades, a pool of compute, which naturally is amenable to running mech-type functionality. 
so we have more efficiency because we can handle other applications entirely. You'll notice, again, I've got my little timing icons. I'm very proud of those. Um, the, to the previous timing presentations, um, the alternative proposition is perhaps accelerator cards, accelerator NICs with onboard timing. What we can do here is take the timing off board into one centralized place. So now we are a little bit closer to having a generic compute pool rather than resources that are entirely specific to baseband processing, which can be otherwise a limitation. So that concludes this use case. Or at least it does if the clicker works. There we go. So let's move on to some conclusions. So EVPN layer two with low latency SR forwarding, and I think everybody here who's in mobile knows how important that low latency is, is very suitable for this kind of front hall pooling or the inter-DU coordination. Both of these are proprietary mechanisms, um, but, we would, but particularly the front hall pooling we are seeing quite generically. Secondly, I would highlight this, that uh, our world tends to go from proprietary to standards. So is the mobile world going from proprietary to standards. So it will keep throwing up these sort of tricky challenges with very tight latency requirements. I would highlight that the requirements for a cell site tend to be quite alien to enterprise equipment. Specifically, frequency and sync distribution, particularly with the extreme accuracy previously described as being required, is very difficult for enterprise equipment. Running at extended temperature, uh, being able to run in a street cabinet without modification, so that means being relatively shallow, um, being able to handle the extended temperatures without air conditioning. Most enterprise equipment simply cannot do that. That is why you need dedicated telco grade transport equipment. So that concludes my presentation.